Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Last week, we completed our sketch of the high point of Greek philosophy, the philosophy of Aristotle. According to Aristotle, as we saw, man lives in a world which is fully real and scientifically intelligible. His mind is competent to gain objective knowledge of this world, of reality, by the use of reason and logic based on the evidence of the senses. The good life is eudaimonia, happiness, and it is achievable here on earth. And the crown of human virtues, expressing man's confidence in himself and his ability to deal with reality, was, you remember, pride, embodied in the great-souled man. Now, if you know anything about the subsequent development of philosophy, you know that this Aristotelian approach to philosophy did not endure in the ancient world. Some five or six hundred years after Aristotle, Christianity began to become dominant. And it preached the exact opposite of all these Aristotelian tenets. It preached that man lives in an unintelligible, semi-real shadow world as contrasted to the reality and perfection of God. That knowledge depends on faith and revelation. That life on earth is a veil of tears in preparation for a supernatural destiny after death and that humility is man's proper self-estimate. A series of tenets which together paved the way for that long night of mankind, which we now refer to as the Dark and the Middle Ages. The question is how, by what steps, did philosophy pass from the height of Aristotle to the depth of Christianity? It was in this five or six hundred years between Aristotle and the emergence of Christianity as the dominant viewpoint, that man fell to his knees to remain there for over 1,000 years. Why and how? That's our topic this evening, the transition from rational Greek confidence to Christian mystic self-abasement. Now, this transition period is known as Hellenistic, or sometimes post-Aristotelian philosophy. And it comprises four main non-Christian pagan schools that we want to look at this evening. The Epicureans, the Stoics, the Skeptics with a capital S, and the Neoplatonists. Now, if you want to give a title to tonight's lecture, call it The Long Drawn Out Death of Ancient Pagan Philosophy. For the record, I should say that the material we will cover this evening is, relatively speaking, much less important than what we have covered in the course so far. Some individual points of these various philosophies have been very influential and survive till this day, so the period is worth covering. And also, of course, it is absolutely necessary to know it if you are to understand the rise of Christianity. But, in its essentials, the philosophies of, in their essentials, the philosophies of this period are all unoriginal. They are derivatives of earlier schools. The thinkers of these centuries are, without exception, second-rate minds. That is why, having devoted five lectures to the period from Thales to Aristotle, a period of 250 years, we can now cover four schools stretching across some 600 years in one evening. But if you think that's something, wait till the next lecture, <laughs> when we'll cover up more than a thousand years in one night. Now, there's a great deal you could say, but none of it is too crucial in connection with many of these points, so I'm adopting the procedure whenever I get to some such tangential point of simply indicating you there is such and such a point here that could be made, and if you're interested, you use the question period to ask it of me, and I'll answer whichever points I get in the question period, particularly if they're ones that I have hinted at during the lecture. But I'll make extensive use of the question period in this respect. Now, in general, <clears throat> the main concern of most of the post-Aristotelian philosophers was the realm of ethics, the question of how to live. In part, there were practical political reasons for this. The Greek world during this whole period was progressively losing its autonomy and dominance. There were a series of wars and political upheavals of various kinds, 
the old stable Greek city-state order was passing away. And as you probably know, by the second century BC, Greece lost its autonomy and became merely a province of Rome. In this situation, the Greeks felt that they were living in a chaotic world. They were no longer masters of their fate, no longer in control of the world around them. It's not too stretched to say something on the order of the atmosphere of England today in contrast to the 19th century. Fear, anxiety, insecurity progressively characterized the whole period. Philosophers were addressing themselves to the question, how to achieve peace of mind in a troubled, insecure world? How to be saved from all the evils and uncertainties of life as they saw it? How to achieve salvation? And most of these post-Aristotelian philosophies are called salvation philosophies because their basic goal is to tell the individual how to achieve salvation. In other words, inner tranquility and peace amidst the chaos of a dissolving world. There is therefore a streak of malevolence that underlies all post-Aristotelian philosophy. The goal is not how to achieve a full life in a rational universe, but rather how to escape being too badly hurt in a chaotic and even a hostile universe. Now against that background, let us begin by looking at Epicurus, 342 to 270 BC, and his most famous disciple in Rome, Lucretius, whose famous poem De Rerum Natura on the nature of things is a poetic expression of Lu uh, Epicurus's philosophy. Lucretius is first century BC. Now his goal, uh, as most of the philosophers of this period, uh, Epicurus's, was to achieve happiness, as he construed it, for the individual. And he thought that there were two main fears that stood in the way of men achieving happiness. The fear of the gods, or in general, the fears inculcated by religion, and the fear of death. As to the gods, they, according to Epicurus, are one of the main factors inhibiting human happiness. The gods, he says, are presented to us by religious people as fickle creatures. They are supposed to have power to interfere in human life, to inflict favors or punishment at their arbitrary decree. How can anybody have any sense of security if you believe a thing like this? If you believe that you are at the mercy of the arbitrary decrees of these allegedly divine beings. You never know what's coming next. You will necessarily feel anxious and helpless. As to death, the second main fear, he said people fear it because they're told that when you die, your soul goes to an unknown realm. Retribution is visited on you by some unknown standard. You're in effect delivered up to some inconceivable dimension ruled over by arbitrary powers. We have to combat these two fears. How? Well, we need an appropriate philosophic basis to make them unwarranted. And for this basis, Epicurus looks back to past philosophic systems and selects the one that he believes to be most congenial to the ethical conclusions he wants to reach. Now you see his procedure here. He does not originate a system of metaphysics or look at reality independently. Instead, he looks back and selects what he thinks is most convenient for his purposes out of what's already been formulated. And as such, he is a philosopher of the second rank, to be generous. And that is true of the whole post-Aristotelian period. Independent interest in major philosophic issues in metaphysics and epistemology is largely past now. The age of real originality is past. Hereafter, they borrow from their predecessors and tinker, making minor modifications within the framework of systems and approaches already established. <clears throat> Epicurus decided that the best system for his purposes was the atomism of Democritus. You remember the little tiny uncuttables, the atoms, moving through the void strictly by mechanistic laws, functioning like little billiard balls, and everything on this theory is simply a combination of atoms constantly mixing and unmixing in different combinations. And you recall that the soul also was made of atoms, of soul atoms, which were perfectly physical. You could theoretically have a handful of soil, but they were very round, smooth, fine atoms. 
Now this metaphysics, as you can see, gets rid of the two fears. The gods are obviously superfluous on this philosophy. Epicurus still accepted the existence of gods, apparently because they appeared to people in dreams and he didn't know how to account for this if there were no gods. But he held that the gods are made only of atoms, they have no power to interfere with human beings. They, too, are just uh, atomic collections. And he, in effect, thought of them as a sort of glorified race living off in seclusion somewhere, having no ability or desire to influence or affect human life. For practical purposes, therefore, Epicureanism is an atheistic approach to philosophy, as would have to be the case of any materialism. Uh, though, as I said, he did believe in the gods in the sense just mentioned. As far as death is concerned, well, there is, of course, no immortality on the atomist metaphysics. You are simply a certain combination of soul and body atoms. Your consciousness, your personal identity, your sense of you depends on a complex structure of soul atoms quivering <coughs> in a complex structure of body atoms. <coughs> death is simply the dissolution of these structures. The atoms go floating off in new combinations, you have disintegrated, there is no you anymore. And so there's no immortality, and death, therefore, is nothing to fear. <coughs> now, this particular point Epicurus expressed in a famous uh, form, which is not dependent upon his atomism as such. He put it this way, this is not an exact quote, but the essence of his idea. Where death is, you aren't. And where you are, death isn't. Death, therefore, he said, concerns neither the living nor the dead. It doesn't concern the living because they are living. And it doesn't concern the dead because they are not. <coughs> Hence, the fear of death is empty. When it comes, by that fact, you are gone. Therefore, you will never know anything but life. And it is senseless to fear a state you will never know. So much for the fear of death. Now, I observe in passing that this is a perfectly valid unanswerable argument, and is amply sufficient to answer today's existentialist uh, who wander around moaning neurotically about death as the catastrophic metaphysical threat hanging over human life which makes everything meaningless and absurd. They simply have no even attempted answer to Epicurus on this point. Atomism, therefore, says Epicurus, relieves us of our two main fears. But it brings up a new problem and a new fear, namely determinism. I'm here presenting Epicurus. It takes away the fear of the gods. We are no longer pawns of the gods. But, says Epicurus, are we now to be a pawn of the laws of mechanics? Are we now passive robots without free will? reacting simply to the inexorable laws of physics without any control over our own destinies? Have we escaped one tyranny, the tyranny of the gods, simply to embrace an equal tyranny, the tyranny of mechanics? We must, says Epicurus, find a place for free will within the framework of a materialistic, atomistic philosophy. Now, how are we going to do this? inasmuch as there is no such thing as mind, apart from atoms, which is capable of making choices. How can you have free will on a materialist metaphysics? Well, to understand his answer, let us leave this issue for a moment and look briefly at Epicurus's physics, then we'll return. At one point, trying to explain the origin of the world, Epicurus hypothesized that a long, long time ago, when the atoms were in their most primitive state, before they combined into worlds, they were merely falling down in straight lines, sort of like a steady rain of atoms. He thought this because he, of course, knew nothing about the law of gravity. He thought that atoms had weight as an inherent uh, property, that they had a certain heaviness, just the way they have a certain shape in themselves. And as such, he thought, left to their own devices, they would just fall straight down, because that's... Uh, Things with weight, as we observe here on Earth, fall straight down, if unimpeded. Now his problem was, from this initial reign of atoms, how to get the atoms together to make worlds. We need some collisions among the atoms. Now I should say that since they were in a vacuum, since they were traveling through the void, they all, he thought, fall at the same speed, so none of them would ever catch the others. 
So the question is, how would they get together? We know they must have got together because they now exist in all kinds of combinations. Well, he said there's only one way. If it were the case that every once in a while certain atoms could move sideways, ever so little, just enough to collide with an adjoining line of falling atoms and start a component of motion in the sideways direction, we would thereby generate all sorts of collisions. The various atoms would smash into and away from each other, and ultimately, by strict mechanical laws, we'd bring about all the combinations that create the world of shoes and ships and ceiling wax and people and planets, etc. The problem then is to get certain atoms moving sideways. Now Epicurus asked himself, why would they ever do this? By all the laws of physics, they should merely go down. That's what their weight dictates. Yet they must go sideways. But there's no reason for them to go sideways. Well, given this dilemma, Epicurus took the bull by the horns. And he said, every once in a while, for no reason, <laughs> Not that we don't know the reason, but that even if we were omniscient, there would be no reason, no cause. Every once in a while, some of these little atoms lurch to the side. This is completely causeless, sheer chance, metaphysically, an uncaused event. The atoms, so to speak, occasionally go on a metaphysical bender. <laughs> now, these uncaused, exceptional, sideways lurches are called Epicurean swerves. <laughs> and it represents the abandonment of the universal law of cause and effect. Most of the time, of course, the atoms obey the laws of mechanics and are lawful, but occasional swerves are possible. Now, in the swerve Epicurus thought, he had the solution to the problem of free will and determinism. Because, he says, it's not true that we are pawns of inexorable laws. Our soul atoms also can swerve causelessly. They can break the laws of mechanics. They can escape their billiard ball destiny by periodically lurching causelessly. And as such, we are free to act in defiance of causal laws. And we are therefore in control of our behavior. We have free will. Now, this is the view that free will requires the denial of causality. And it is known technically as indeterminism, determinism with the prefix I-N. That is defined as the view that causality is not universal and that free will requires a breach of causality. If determinism is the view that everything is inevitable, nothing could ever happen any differently, man has no choice, indeterminism comes back with, yes, he has, because there are no iron-bound laws of reality, causeless swervings can occur. Now I observe here that this is, in fact, a hopeless theory. Although it's not at all uncommon, many subsequent philosophers have taken their cue from Epicurus on this issue. For instance, Kant or William James, many of the existentialists, many of the disciples of the physicist Werner Heisenberg, <coughs> and they have tried to defend free will by an attack on cause and effect. So it's not in any way restricted to Epicurus or atomism. I say that this is a hopeless position because, among many other reasons, a human being has no more control over his actions on the theory of indeterminism than on the theory of determinism. You are no more responsible for actions which are causeless than for actions which are determined from all eternity by forces outside your control. Now, for instance, suppose I were to walk casually by minding my own business, and my arm lurches out and stabs someone in the path. And that is a causeless event. And I'm then hailed before the judge uh, to account for my behavior. I would have a perfect right to say, what, why bring it up to me? I was minding my own business. <laughs> and uh, this uh, Epicurean swerve took place. <laughs> in other words, uh, free will and uh, self-responsibility cannot be uh, salvaged by abandoning causality. Now, I assume that uh, the correct position on this issue, you know as it's covered extensively in the objectivist literature, if there are any questions on how, in fact, you do reconcile free will and cause and effect,
I'll be glad to discuss that in the question period. For our purposes during the lecture, I simply want you to know that Epicurus is one of the main originators of the attempt to equate free will with causeless action, and thus one of the main philosophers to put the concept of free will in disrepute. So much for his metaphysics. His epistemology is without value or particular originality or influence, so we will simply ignore it. Now let us look now at Epicurus's ethics. His ethics rests on what he took to be a basic observed fact of human behavior. Namely, that all men want only one fundamental thing in life. Pleasure, or the avoidance of pain, for themselves. Now this is supposed, in his viewpoint, to be a factual description of human psychology. The way people, in fact, behave and necessarily behave by their nature as human. This is a view which many, many centuries later was christened psychological hedonism. Psychological hedonism. Hedonism, of course, from the stress on pleasure, the Greek for pleasure being hedone, and psychological hedonism because it claims to be a psychological description of human behavior. As such, this doctrine is not an evaluation. It doesn't say it's good or bad to pursue pleasure. It says, says simply, that is how people are. Now, if you want a definition of psychological hedonism, it is the view that all men, by their very nature as men, necessarily pursue one and only one fundamental goal in all of their actions. Namely, to gain as much pleasure and or as little pain as possible for themselves. This doctrine is therefore a species of a broader doctrine called psychological egoism, which maintains that all men by their nature are necessarily egoistic, but leaves open what in particular they're after. Psychological hedonism subscribes to that and says, and besides that, the particular thing they're after is pleasure. Now, on the basis of this doctrine, as I said, it was not enunciated, not called psychological hedonism at this time. That's a much later name for it. But on the basis of this doctrine, Epicurus formulates his ethical code. He reasons like this. If this is the way man is by nature, then ethics must build on this fact. <clears throat> there is no use telling man to act for something else if he has no alternative but to pursue his own selfish pleasure. And one uh, advocate of this view put it this way. He said, suppose man were so built that the only thing he could care about was lemon pies. He would be a psychological lemon pieist. Well, if so, when you came to ethics, you'd have to say, if you're basing ethics on human nature, the supreme value is lemon pies. You would then become an ethical lemon pieist on the grounds that man has no choice. Consequently, we reach the doctrine known as ethical hedonism, which is now an evaluative doctrine, and it is defined as follows. Pleasure and pleasure alone is good in itself. Pain and pain alone is bad in itself. And everything else, every other candidate for value and virtue, is to be evaluated depending upon its pleasure-pain consequences. Putting it more briefly, Ethical hedonism is the doctrine that pleasure is the standard of all ethical evaluation. And you see the relation between these two doctrines. Psychological hedonism is a description. Ethical hedonism erects an ethics on the basis of it. Epicurus subscribed to both, and the first was really the argument for the second, although he did not always very clearly differentiate between the two. Now, I'm not going to criticize these two during the lecture this evening. Both are false. Uh, I refer you to the objectivist literature, again, where they're covered. Uh, on ethical hedonism, there's a brief piece by me in one of the very early, I think, the first issue of the objectivist uh, newsletter back in 62. And there's, of course, considerable discussion by Ms. Rand of these topics. I'll take any further questions on these two doctrines in the question period. Uh, also, if you're interested in the difference between hedonism and eudaimonism, that is to say between ethics which take pleasure as the standard of value and ethics which take happiness as the standard of value, and how both of those differ from objectivism which takes life as the standard of value, I will be glad to answer that in the question period also. <laughs>
What I want to do now is to look at Epicurus's concept of the means by which the life of pleasure is to be achieved because that is his distinctive contribution to hedonistic ethics. Hedonism as such, he did not originate. Uh, it actually started with a school of followers of Socrates called the Cyrenaics. We didn't mention them in this course. But uh, the most famous early hedonist was Aristippus, who preached in effect the doctrine, eat, drink, and make merry, for tomorrow you die and his disciples were in practice indistinguishable from the sophists. But that is certainly not Epicurus's concept of how to achieve the life of pleasure, and so he is original eminently in his idea of how to achieve the life of pleasure. He is not a Cyrenaic, you know, uh, gather ye rosebuds while ye may type of hedonist. Now to understand his view of the means, I remind you of what I said earlier, the streak of malevolence and insecurity running throughout this era. It deeply affected Epicurus. In effect, he said as follows, in this kind of world, the more you care about something, the more you value it, the more passionately you desire something, the more open you are to being hurt, the more vulnerable to pain you are. If you place a premium on wealth, then, of course, you watch, I'm updating the examples, but the point is his. Then uh, you watch the stock market with your heart in your throat, or the latest fiscal policies of the Federal Reserve System and inflation, and etc. Whereas, if your attitude is, money doesn't matter to me, you are oblivious to the ups and downs of the economy. If you care passionately about another human being, you have a romantic, deep, intense involvement, a small insult or snub, to say nothing of a betrayal, on the part of that person can wound you to the depth of your soul. On the other hand, if you are indifferent to somebody, like a stranger on the street, and he does the equivalent, you simply look at him and say, why well, tell it to me and it has no effect on you at all, because you don't care. This is true of any value. If you value your appearance seriously, you will look in the mirror each day and see yourself growing older. If you have a sumptuous repast and you care about it, you have a stomachache, etc. There is nothing you can count on in this world. If you want something from the world, you only open yourself to pain. To achieve true happiness, Epicurus concludes, we must value only that which is dependent on us ourselves. We have to be self-sufficient in ourselves. And only that way can we be in control and invulnerable to the thrusts of a cruel, uncertain world. What we need, therefore, above all, is independence. Not just independence from other men, but independence of reality. Every time we care about something, we give a hostage to fate, a hostage to destiny. Every time you want something from this world, you put yourself in the power of reality. You, it has a chance to get at you and to hurt you. Well, if you want to achieve a calm inner happiness, what then must you do? How can you become independent of what goes on in the world around you? You can't, he thought, change or improve the world. That's hopeless. What you can do is stop it from affecting you. The ordinary man lets the world stir up in him passions, feelings, desires. The wise man, he says, should see that these are really enemies, namely desires, passions. It's your passions, your emotions, which hold you to reality. It's your emotions which suck you back into the stream of events of life and which open you to being hurt. Consequently, the wise man will conquer his emotions. He will stop feeling. He will become essentially, essentially emotionless and in that way, he will become imperturbable, invulnerable. And this is the great virtue for Epicurus, to become emotionless. You see in what way it's a variation, modification, and derivative of Plato's view, but with his own distinctively Epicurean flavor to it. Well, how should you live then once this happens? Well, you obviously wouldn't expect to live a life of achievement, creation, action, of going out in the world and fighting for your values, 
but just the opposite. A life of withdrawal from the world, of retirement from the cares of life, of indifference to the spectacle of daily fears, uh, daily affairs. Uh, you want to capture it in an aphorism, the essence of Epicurus' philosophy on this point is nothing ventured, nothing lost. Or uh, better be safe than sorry. Wall yourself in from reality, and then it can't hurt you. And it's very appropriate, therefore, that Epicurus had himself built a sheltered garden uh, with, I gather, good solid walls. Uh, and it's always referred to as the sheltered garden of Epicurus. And he proceeded to retire into the garden, uh, live ascetically, that is to say, for a Greek, of course, um, <laughs> Uh, eat a simple diet with a few chosen friends, hold quiet philosophic discourses, and let the world outside the garden go to hell. <laughs> Hence, the greatest happiness is absence of strong emotions and cessation of action. Notice, therefore, that happiness is something negative for Epicurus. It is the state of not being hurt. Pleasure for him is absence of pain in the body and worry in the mind. So-called positive pleasure the actual positive experience of pleasure depends on positive desires, and that, of course, leaves you vulnerable and anxious. The model of happiness should be, we might say, dreamless sleep. Epicurus himself chose the example of having a good digestion. Being rather dyspeptic himself, he thought there were only two states with regard to digestion, and he's right, there are. Either your digestion is kicking up and causing you trouble, or it's acting well, in which case you don't notice it. Nobody has a positive thrill inside. <laughs> and of those two states, of course, uh, he identified happiness with the absence of trouble. And apparently that was one of the factors contributing to this theory. So it is a complete mistake, historically, for modern restaurants to call themselves Epicurean and uh, the term Epicure and so on. As one professor of mine put it, Epicurus's motto was not at all eat, drink, and make merry, for tomorrow you die. This is completely false. His motto, if anything, was neither eat, drink, nor make merry, lest tomorrow you diet. <laughs> you get the idea. Emotionlessness will make you independent of reality, self-sufficient, invulnerable, and therefore you won't feel pain, fear, and worry, and that is happiness. Now this is the essence of Epicurus' view. He mitigated it somewhat, because he allowed some positive pleasures, if they are not too violent, don't stir you up, excite you, and bind you to the world again. He himself emphasized intellectual pleasures and the pleasures of friendship as superior to physical pleasures because the former, he thought, were less violent and more in your own control. He advocated a simple life of philosophic converse in the garden with a few chosen friends, about whom presumably you do not care too passionately, so that if one of them gets sick and dies, you take it with a philosophic shrug. He uh, said at one point that there were three kinds of desires. One, natural and necessary and that includes food, drink, and shelter in the appropriately modest forms. Two, natural but unnecessary, and that includes sex and fame. And third, unnatural and unnecessary, and that is essentially the desire for luxury. You simply live a frugal, simple life. As far as sex here is a quote from Epicurus, quote, sexual intercourse has never done a man good, and he is lucky if it has not harmed him, unquote. <laughs> you see, sex is a very violent emotion, and uh, even at best, if you could tame it, it's uh, a distraction from more tranquil pursuits. Uh, Lucretius, by the way, agrees that sexual love is to be avoided, but he says that it's all right to engage in sexual intercourse <coughs> so long as it's devoid of passion. <laughs> I leave this to you to project. Now notice, therefore, that we see the process of man turning away from life on earth already begun at this early stage. Here we have a philosophy which is materialistic, essentially atheistic, hedonist. Now on the face of it, that is as non-religious as a philosophy can be. And yet, 
what it boils down to in its practical recommendations is withdraw, give up, retire from life, don't let yourself be hurt. Now, Epicurus really merely represents the start of this process of withdrawal. He is not yet by any means consistent. Uh, he still wants all kinds of things from life. Pleasure, for instance, even if of a negative sort. He wants his garden. He wants his few friends. He wants his good digestion, etc. <clears throat> now, by his own reasoning, if he were fully consistent, he should abandon all of these also, because any one of them could open him up to pain. As, for instance, if a friend goes bad or his garden wall comes crumbling down or is taxed by the city administration, etc. The possibility of pain, in a word, is inherent in pursuing any values. In other words, the possibility is inherent in life as such. If you want to avoid it absolutely, there's only one sure way to do it, and that is death. Dead men, as the saying goes, feel no pain. Now, this conclusion Epicurus did not draw. He is the beginning of an era, not yet the end of it. Um, as you will see, however, the next school is much more consistent on this point, although still not yet fully. And let us now turn to the next school this evening, the Stoics. Did Aristotle have any significant effect at all on the several centuries immediately following his death? Significant effect? In the sense I would mean significant, no. Uh, several of his individual doctrines, his school went on, right on, and he had some very intelligent followers, Theophrastus in particular, but uh, no, uh, no real effect of his overall distinctive approach. Why didn't Aristotle catch on in the way all these others did? I'm asked that question all the time. Uh, the only thing I can say is uh, what I said uh, essentially so far. Namely, a philosophy's effect is determined by its ethics. If its ethics is deficient, that is a mortal blow to the possibility of it guiding men at large. Aristotle's ethics is deficient. It's streaked with Platonism. And uh, you must understand something. Everything I presented to you in uh, about Aristotle is correct. I didn't distort or, you know, make him better than he is. But I'll tell you something perfectly frankly, if it's of any help to you in this connection. When I first read Aristotle, I did not appreciate his value. I could not understand why Ayn Rand was such an admirer of Aristotle. Now, I say in my own defense I was a teenager, and I didn't know very much of anything, but I couldn't get it. He said a few good things, but he said so many wrong things I simply couldn't grasp. In other words, I'll put it to you this way. Prior to my being an objectivist, I was not able to appreciate Aristotle. And I think to a large extent, this is true of mankind as a whole. You can grasp the real values of Aristotle, given the nature of the manuscripts we have and the mixture as he presents it, only when you see the distinctive doctrines presented pure as part of a whole integrated philosophy, including, above all, an integrated ethics and politics. But that's hindsight, you see. To the people at the time, Aristotle didn't come across as an anticipation of Ayn Rand. <laughs> Uh, they saw him as a philosopher for a philosophic elite, uh, writing about a city-state which had passed into history, and the question was what to do here and now. Now, I don't say that that's a full explanation. Uh, you simply can't get around the fact that however primitive and ignorant the time was, here was a genius who was ignored. And there has to be some dishonesty on the part of some people to account for this fully. But that's an area I don't care to get into as a philosopher. Have there been any psychological hedonists who were not ethical hedonists? Yes, I can't offhand think of the names, but in theory, I've met that type. And their reasoning is simply this. If man is necessitated to pursue pleasure and has no choice about the running of his life, 
morality is simply out of the picture. It's a waste of time. There's no use telling a piece of chalk once you throw it out the window. By the way, it's your moral obligation to fall. Because if the chalk could hear you, it would answer back, don't bother telling me, I'm going to do it anyway. And if man is necessitated to pursue pleasure, so it's so this type argues, it's senseless to build any ethical theory, even a hedonistic kind, on its basis. And that, of course, is valid. But it presupposes, of course, that, that um, determinism is incompatible with morality. Please discuss the issue of life versus happiness versus pleasure as the standard of value in an ethics. Yes. First, let us take the um, issue of hedonism versus eudaimonism, life versus happiness. What's the difference? Well, in general, there's two main points. Hedone, or pleasure, is, uh, as the Greek term was used, exclusively an emotional state a state of feeling a certain kind of enjoyment or satisfaction. Whereas eudaimonia, as we saw last time, is a much broader concept, involving a total way of life, not only emotion, but thought, achievement, action. And secondly, hedone, pleasure, is a short-range, temporary feeling. You experience pleasure for a minute, or if you're lucky, for an hour, but it doesn't go on in perpetuity. Uh, it's, it's broken with intervals of indifference or pain, etc. And so the good life for the hedonist consists of having as big a number of discrete, pleasurable experiences as you can, having a sum of, in effect, disconnected separate pleasures. In this sense, hedonism is a short-range mentality in ethics. It simply wants as much discrete units of enjoyment as it can get. Whereas eudaimonia is a much more philosophic approach. Happiness represents a, an enduring, long-range state of the total person, a character attribute in effect, not an ephemeral feeling. And you see, we can talk about, for instance, a happy person, but you wouldn't talk about a pleased person as a character attribute. One is ephemeral, the other is enduring. So in these respects, in these two respects, eudaimonia, eudaimon, eudaimonism, is, of course, much superior as an ethical standard to hedonism. Now, I should add, however, that uh, very often today, the word happiness is used by hedonists as simply a long-range preponderance of pleasure over pain. That is, they interpret the concept hedonistically. And that being so, a hedonist will talk uh, completely indifferently of pleasure or happiness, and so the distinction here collapses. This is simply of, of historical point of the relation between Aristotle and the eudaimonist, uh, and the hedonist. Now, as to um, uh, the objectivist view, objectivism opposes any theory which makes an emotion, whether long run or short run, a standard of value. Objectivism says, and for details I refer you to Ayn Rand's work on the objectivist ethics, uh, the opening essay in The Virtue of Selfishness, uh, because that ex discusses the issue explicitly. Objectivism holds that happiness, uh, enjoyment of life, can properly be the ultimate purpose of ethics, but never the standard. Now, by an ethical standard, we mean that criterion, that measuring rod, by a reference to which we determine the value or virtue of any other candidate. Is this action right or wrong? By reference to this standard. Is this action, uh, quality good or bad? By reference to this standard. Is this purpose desirable or undesirable? By reference to this standard. Now, if your ethics is to be objective, your standard must be a fact, not a feeling. It must be something that you can prove objectively, is de de determines a necessary set of derivative values. Now, if the life of the organism is the standard, that is a fact, and it has definite objective requirements regardless of who feels what, and you have an objective ethics. But if happiness is the standard, well, then the first question is, what is happiness? It's an inner emotional state. And what kind of state? It's a state that comes from per achieving your values. Well, that presupposes you have a code of values, then. What was the standard of that code, and where did you get it from? Now, if an emotion is a response to values, 
then to make an emotion the standard is to make your response to values the standard of values. But a response to values presupposes a code of values. So you're going in a hopeless circle. And the result is that anybody who takes an emotion as a standard is philosophically parasitic. He is actually, in fact, regardless of his protestations, simply taking over, eclectically usually, the values generated by philosophers who do not hold emotions as the standard. He's accepting and absorbing them, reacting on the basis, and then using his subjective emotion as the standard. Now, Aristotle did not intend to be subjective. That's why he insisted that eudaimonia was not simply emotion. But, of course, it did include it, and it is a serious error. And in that one respect, Aristotle's ethics does incline towards subjectivism. Uh, now, I don't mean to suggest that Ayn Rand chose life as the standard because she, she wanted an objective ethics and that was the only way to get one. That would be the primacy of consciousness. She proved that life is the standard. So uh, it's not that she had a desire, so she distorted ethics in order to satisfy it. That would be the primacy.